Good afternoon. Roy Oppenheim here, Zoom at noon. I say it every week, but this is the 24th week that we are uh, streaming live uh, from uh, Western Florida as we take us all through this pandemic and, and its impact on our lives, our individual lives, and, and our offices, our businesses, and our family. Uh, last week, we discussed uh, how bankruptcy is playing a role in, in, in real estate and and its role for people who are uh, behind on their rent, if they're shopkeepers or if there are gyms or if they have other kinds of facilities. And this week we're talking about the impact of the K-shaped economy on real estate. And the first question, of course, we're all gonna have is what the K-shaped economy really is, which we're gonna talk about. But first, as usual, I want to uh, thank uh, my staff. I wanna thank Ellen, my wife, and my partner and Jeff Sherman, who's, who's directing today, and Lance Oppenheim, my son, who helped put the presentation together, as well as the rest of my organization, uh, Mia Singh, who's my senior associate, Paola, who's of counsel, Paola Vergara, and Wayne Patton, who, who does our trust in the states, who's also of counsel. And equally important, I would like to thank Ken Morris, who's with us today. He's been a guest on this show numerous times on this podcast, and uh, he's always a delight to have because he's very, very engaging and can tell us what's going on in the real estate market and business from the ground because like us he's he's right right there in in the trenches uh let's go to the next page if we can let's do the weekly economic update uh so the economic recovery what recovery who is it benefiting who is it not benefiting you know it kind of reminds me uh, maybe many of you have 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 read dickens a tale of two cities it's the best of times it's the worst of times uh it's a time of of light, it's a time of darkness. And so we're, we're seeing these same very themes that actually were, were the foundational inspiration for the, for the uh, Revolutionary War uh, way back in 1776. But, but importantly, we're, we're seeing two real components of, of the K. We see the upside, the stock market, the S&P, billionaires becoming not trillionaires yet, but close to it. Uh, we're seeing uh, the CARES Act, including uh, all kinds of, of handouts, not just to, to individuals, but also to multimillionaires. We're seeing the S&P breaking new records. And at the same time, on the bottom side, we're seeing the, the greatest unemployment literally in our lifetime since the Great Depression. We're seeing unemployment rates at over 10.2% nationally, and that's just of those people they're counting. Uh, we have in Florida, you know, an 11% unemployment. We have 43 million people who are, uh, in, you know, literally at the risk of being evicted once these moratoriums are lifted. Uh, we have people who are food insecure, uh, you know, one of the largest percentages in the history of any of our lifetimes. We have food banks where, where lines go on for miles with people in cars. We have hundreds of thousands of small businesses, particularly minority small businesses, unlike large businesses that are thriving, that, that are going to close. This has become an existential event for so many folks in the, in the tourism business, uh, you know, folks associated with, with cruising and the airline industry and hotels and, and travel agents. And of course, restaurants who, who haven't been able to figure out how to serve food outdoors or, 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 or to get delivery done properly. Uh, those places, um, you know, all are going to have a huge problem. And so you have this K-shaped economy, people who can work from home and those people who, who, are, who are assisting those people who are working from home by making the deliveries, the Amazon deliverers, the folks who are delivering food and other stuff. And so it, it's really like the best and worst of times. It, it is effectively a tale of two cities. Uh, as the K-shape uh, widens, we, we're seeing that, that many people uh, with financial assets and white collar jobs are benefiting from the economic downturn. They're seeing their 401k plans are actually now growing uh, while the rest of the country is barely staying afloat. Uh, wealthy and middle-class asset holders have retained and resumed their, their wealth and their jobs and the value of their assets and their stock portfolios. Yet the divergent realities are uh, guiding policy policymakers as Congress is trying to figure out what, what the next stimulus is going to be. Without another stimulus, um, I'm not sure how people are going to be able to continue to pay their rent and how we're going to be able to maintain what has become a very fragile social fabric in, in this nation. Uh, the financial uh, finance 202 economists are talking about this K-shaped recovery, a stock surge, but in, in that inequality widens. We're seeing that that folks that are making uh, the, the highest dollar per value uh, per hour of uh, 32 bucks, if we look at the top line, uh, their their jobs actually have, are increasing. And that's probably a lot of folks in, in the tech tech world. And then folks 
uh, that were making under $14 an hour saw the largest precipitous drop in, in salaries and in jobs. And, and while that has come back, it has not come back yet. And it's still 16 to 20% below where it was just in January of this year. This is just uh, an example of, of, of what's going on in the, in the real estate world. And uh, let's get Ken on. And by the way, this is supposed to be interactive. I expect you folks to have some comments, some questions. Uh, it's hard for me, you know, for 24 weeks in a row just to stand here and talk. And so it's very important that if you have questions and comments or want to challenge something that we're saying, you know, we invite you to do so. Um, I also want to mention that, you know, this is being sponsored both by my law firm and my title, our title company, Weston Title and Escrow. And again, to some extent, early on, there was a tale of two cities there too, where the title company was thriving and people were buying and selling homes and refinancing. Yet the law firm, things had slowed down because the courts were effectively shut down. Uh, that is starting to change now, but it is interesting that there is this divergence of hot and cold success and not success going on uh, all over the economy. Uh, Ken, are we there? Do we got Ken on? Hey, Ken. Hey, how are you? Very well. Ken, Ken Morris, good friend, uh, been in the real estate business for 30 years. Uh, Morris Southeastern is, is uh, uh, has done so well in this in this market and, and, and is very nimble and it comes from a great family of, of, of very successful folks in, in the real estate industry. Ken, it's good good to have you back. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. So so what what let's go back to this first picture. So what so what do you what, what what's your first thought when you see this? Well, this is this is really what's going on. I mean, um, most of the tenants in Manhattan, 95% of the office workers have not gone back to their, to their office buildings. And the longer this continues, the longer it will continue. Down here in South Florida, I'm seeing the same thing. Empty office buildings, empty office parks. Um, you know, this is going to continue for some time until there is some type of comfort level from a vaccine or something that people are not going to be so afraid to go back to the office. But this is indicative of what's going on. And technology, I mean, we're, we're doing this by Zoom. Zoom works. Microsoft Teams works. There's uh, a few other platforms that work. Doesn't mean people are excited to go in from Zoom call to Zoom call, but the technology works and, and business is still being conducted. And really, the most workers that are knowledge workers have been untethered or detethered from from the workspace. And, and let me, and let me just, there's a question, which I just, which segues perfectly into what you said. Someone's saying, so what does it really mean a K-shaped economy? Let me give it a first shot and then you can say, but I mean, the K-shaped is, is the, the, the successful person who is in technology, who's, who's working for Zoom, can use Zoom, can use Microsoft platforms and doesn't miss a beat, you know, with, with who they're working for, their company. And then you have, again, the folks who are in the tourism business, the, 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 you could be a pilot, you could, you could work for a ship, you could, you could be in entertainment, you could work for a nightclub, you could be a bartender. You're at the bottom of the K while the other folks are at the top of the K. And then the folks who own 401Ks are at the top of the K and the folks who, who can't pay their rent because they don't have a salary are at the bottom of the K. And so you have this divergence, uh, you know, of, of, of folks, and again, it's hot and cold, success, not success, and to some extent, it's becoming a winner take all because of the network effect that, that's going on through the use of, of technology. What's your, what's your thought? Yeah, I mean, in my world, I look at through the lens of commercial real estate and, and what properties are doing well and what aren't. You know, regional malls, not so good, probably not going to ever be good. Uh, neighborhood retail centers, unless they're surrounded by you know, strong demographics, they too are not gonna do very well. Small businesses are, are under tremendous strain. Many of them are going out of business. We'll probably lose 50 to 60% of the restaurants, you know, throughout North America. That doesn't mean they're gonna, they're, they're never gonna come back, but it's gonna be a whole host of people going into the unemployment line. I see a big tidal wave of unemployment coming later on this year and into 2021. And even when you look at a tale of two office buildings, one could be, you know, in the suburbs surrounded by, you know, high, high end bedroom communities that will do very well because the executives don't want to drive very far to get to their office. And then you could have one that is in maybe not the greatest part of town that will never get reoccupied ever because there's not enough demand pattern for it. It will have to meet the wrecking ball or be repurposed into something else. So I, I, I want to just, just hold, hold that thought. I want, want 
have a, take a look at this S and P 500 image, and then there's a question that that links right into it. If we can go back to the other question, so we're seeing here that 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 folks who are investing in the stock market are, are have a very bright idea of what the future is going to be. They're anticipating that there's going to be a vaccine. They're anticipating that there'll be person-to-person -person contact, that people will be going back to venues, they'll be going back to stadiums, they'll be going back to restaurants. This is suggesting that they're expecting a roaring 20s is, is, what, is what we're suggesting. But the dark side is, is that we have to A, get there, and B, we have to believe that all our problems will be solved by a series of, of vaccines. And I know that there are you know, some real interesting positive aspects and billions of vaccines are being made right now. Some are in phase three. Uh, we, we know that uh, the, the, the convalescence plasma has, has worked for 100 years, and now the government is, is real recognizing that. In fact, if anyone has had COVID, we know people who have. We encourage you to donate blood and to donate your plaza. Uh, we've been encouraging people to do that. We have friends and, and family who've done that already. Not family, but certainly friends. Uh, and, and it's important that, that you do that because you're, you're actually going to be helping your your, your friends. But at the same time, you hear in Hong Kong that someone actually got COVID again, and that's, that's now supposedly uh, been proven. And so the question is how long your antibodies are, are, are going to stay up. But at the same time, someone is suggesting, uh, you know, that for restaurants, for example, this is uh, Jerry Kopensky, a, a good friend, and Jerry suggesting that nothing's going to ever take the place of face-to-face -face time with someone that builds trust, you know, for a relationship, whether it's uh, for business or, or friendship or family. But at the same time, these restaurants, you know, need to be able to buy the time that they need so that they can, again, plan on face-to-face -face time. And, and until you get to that point, you know, we are where we are. And so it's kind of interesting that people are very, very optimistic I don't know if they're irrationally optimistic or if, or if in fact they, they have an idea that, that the things are gonna just get great and be better than they ever were. And so I think time will tell. I, I don't think we have an answer for that. Um, uh, there's another question. Uh, how, how specifically will the price of light industrial and small warehouse space in South Florida fare through the next year and beyond? I'll let you handle that one, Ken. Um, you know, I think that, um, Overall, that small bay flex product will probably do pretty well. Um, but keep in mind that most of the tenants in that product type are small business, which are under, you know, under, you know, pressure. There can only be so many, you know, pool cleaning companies that are going to make it and electricians that are going to make it and, and plumbers and so forth. That's who those small bay flex product, you know, serves that population. With that said, there's really no land left to build that kind of product and the cost of construction is so high that you really can't duplicate it. You can't demo something else and rebuild a small bay flex or small warehouse product because the numbers just will not pencil out, period, end of story. But, you, but, but this is a good segue to the next slide, but we could use malls to actually serve that, that, that un uncatered need. And I want yeah. to talk about yeah, I, 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 I would say maybe. But you know, back back in the early aughts, I was uh, interviewed by the people that had bought the uh, fashion mall, and they want to convert part of the fashion mall or all of it, the fashion mall, to office space. And one of the things that I that I sat down with them and said, I don't think it's going to work. And ultimately, it didn't work. Uh, they never they never got any traction. But I said, just the 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 distance between where you park and where you get to your office was a ten minute walk. I said most people in this market are not gonna be willing to do that. Not to mention all the other improvements that are gonna be necessary. And enclosed malls are basically little ecosystems. And you're not gonna be able to repurpose them unless you spend a tremendous amount of capital expenditure money to repurpose them to something else. Even if you turn them into bulk distribution. And you and I talked briefly uh, uh, this morning about the concept of turning them into, like I I'm a nut. so. Imagine we turn the Broward Mall into like a big gross facility for fish farming, for hydroponics, for cannabis cultiv cultivation. I mean, in essence, one of these big regional malls could feed the area that, that it sits within and have produce being sold and so forth. There's a lot of adaptive reuse that can be done. Most of it's not going to happen. Most of the wrecking ball is going to come in and, and, and knock a lot of them down, I, I predict. So today on the front page of the New York Times, they, they talked about Carl Icahn and, and, and how he went short on a, on a mall ETF. And they went short, which means they were betting against the malls. 
and made like over a billion dollars while the malls are dying and going into bankruptcy and wrecking balls are coming through. And they made a fortune because they bet against the malls, just like certain people bet against the mortgage market in the last economic crisis. They went short. Remember, there was a book and a movie called The Big Short. This big is The short, Big Short yeah. 2.0. But instead of it being mortgages, although that may still come, by the way, that, that, that could be Big Short 3.0 or 2.2 uh, or 2.1. But in this particular case, you know, people have made fortunes on betting against certain sectors. And so here again, we have the malls doing poorly, but we have Wall Street doing phenomenally well by betting and hoping for malls to do poorly. And it's 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 just the nature of how our economy is structured. And some people think it's fair and others think it isn't, but it is what it is. Um, and so the real question is going to be, what do we do with these malls? Amazon said they're going to take over a whole bunch of malls. Some of the mall owners, Simon said that they're going to invest in the retailers inside the malls and actually take over the brands. And they've created a brand division. Not sure how that's going to work, but uh, you know, they're going to be different, different plays on, on what this space is going to be re reused for. Some of it will I don't be think it's, I don't think it's going to be so easy to turn a lot of those regional malls into distribution centers because distribution centers require a specific clear height for them to be efficient. You know, Amazon goes up very high cubic. Most of my distribution center clients that I'm representing locally and around the country look for a minimum of 32 foot clear. A lot of these older mall buildings are not 32 foot clear. So then they're gonna have to go out and that's why they're gonna have more space laterally. But you know, ultimately it'll have to be at a lower cost basis to make it make sense to use those older lower ceiling or roofed properties. But, but the ones with the high ceilings could actually become good production studios also, you know, and you could create regional regional film businesses and if, if, if need be because of the high ceiling. So that- Agreed. Hydroponics, I mean, so there's lots of, of ways for these these buildings to recast themselves if, if we get creative and, and of course the amazon use is is, is the most interesting uh, this slide this next slide is kind of interesting uh it shows uh, how the performance of stocks have not been uniform since january and it's kind of interesting because you know everyone's saying the stock market's at an all-time high the reality is is that 62 percent the light blue uh are, are companies that have done poorly and have lost money compared to january and the dark blue are your Amazons, your Googles, your your Facebooks uh, of the world uh, that have done, and you know that, and the Netflixes and, and and the videos that have done phenomenally well because of this this massive transition that's going on in this economy, this technological revolution, and 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 what's happening is this technological revolution already existed before COVID, but COVID literally has probably exacerbated that revolution and pushed it probably two, three, four, five years ahead of where things are. So we're seeing this truncation. Of, of, of certain companies that are just running away and then they're bringing all the, the indexes up with them. But when you pull back the curtain, you're seeing, if we go to the next slide, that it's a perfect K. We're seeing right here, if, if Jeff can take the cursor, this is, if, if we have this being the axis, and then here, the dark blue is the companies that are doing particularly well, and these are down, you have an absolute perfect K there. And so there again, you have a tale of two cities, a winner loser K economy, not just in terms of employment, not just in terms of, of people who are being successful and not successful, but, but you have it in terms of companies that are doing well and companies that are not doing well. And it's all part of this winner, loser, take all uh, thesis that, that we're talking about here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic and then we'll go back to, to real estate a little bit. Uh, in China, uh, where uh, the pandemic began, life is starting to look normal. And I think maybe that, that's affecting everyone's optimism. This was just a, a rock concert, some sort of concert that just occurred. And, and you're seeing millions, you know, not millions, but thousands and thousands of people packed in together. And, and we're gonna see what happens in the next two weeks. It's gonna be very interesting. Um, and then again, we talked about the first document uh, reinfection reported in Hong Kong. That's not, not great news. Um, but in general, if, if we take a look here at, the, at this red line, we're seeing that the number of cases in the United States is really starting to drop. And if we see these, these gray areas, we're seeing what, what the peaks were. And now we're seeing how, uh, how the averages are here in, in, in the US. And so we're seeing that, that things are starting to get a little bit better. Hospitals not, are not as crazy. And um, you know, in fact, in Broward County, they're talking about going to the next phase of, of allowing certain businesses to get, get back to doing their thing. Um, again, this is Florida. Uh, new reported cases uh, are, are down, and we're seeing certain hotspots in certain parts. But we're seeing, if we go to the end right here, we're seeing that there's a precipitous drop in the number of cases uh, that are going down. And we kind of anticipated that because the number of cases had been dropping. So now we're seeing the number of deaths dropping, dropping off very substantially. Um, 
Impact of the K-shaped recovery, let's keep going as it relates to real estate. Again, Ken, we talked about the office market. So let's talk about the suburban office market. You, you think, Ken, that that's not gonna be hit the same like, like a big city markets, correct? Well, I think that, you know, again, we're very early in the ball game, folks. Uh, you know, anything I can tell you is, is just based on what I'm hearing, talking with a lot of different occupiers and a lot of my colleagues around the country. What is predicted right now is the office is not going to disappear 100%. But I personally predict that the overall footprint will shrink. Most of my clients are shrinking their footprints. And what's going to happen is most enterprises, whether they be Fortune 100 or entrepreneurial small shops, are going to rotate, have a hybrid model where employees rotate in and rotate out. And knowledge workers and people that do not have to even be in a physical place may choose to live in a much less expensive environment, still do great work and still get paid very well and actually have a better standard of living than having to live you know, in Manhattan or live in Silicon Valley. So most of the large enterprise, big companies that are multi-market occupiers are basically looking to reduce their footprints and then push out into the suburbs where they'll have sort of hub and spoke model of occupancy. And instead of having 200,000 square feet in downtown, they'll have 5,000 square feet in a suburb and then 5,000 feet, 100 miles away in another suburb. And that will be the new model. And, so, and, and they call that a hybrid type of model because some people will yes. work from home, sometimes they'll come in, they'll come in. That's right. Community, right. But, but that impact of that's very interesting. And we're seeing that in New York and in other major cities is that allows people to live further and further outside the city. So I had some friends who lived hundreds of miles from New York City for the past three years, right? Or even four years. One lived at the east point of, east, east, uh, of, of, you know, in Montauk. I had someone else living in Massachusetts, someone else living in the Berkshires. And they had jobs in the city of New York. And they had literally would come in like once a week for the past three or four years. They now look at themselves as the trailblazers for what everyone else is doing. And so I don't think when this is over, everyone comes back to live in downtown Brickell on, you know, in downtown Manhattan. I think this idea that we can expand out further is going to have tremendous impact on, on communities north of Palm Beach, you know, uh, maybe on, on the West Coast, going, you know, up to that area between Orlando and, 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 Fort La and, and Palm Beach that, that still isn't that pricey. And you're going to have people who are going to be able to socially distance, have larger spreads, maybe they have to come to Miami once a week, and they will, and they'll drive the two, three hours if they have to. But for the most part, that's where they're going to work. And if they do, maybe they'll have a flex office, you know, in, in, in Palm Beach or something, you know, uh, as opposed to necessarily, you know, coming all the way down. Same thing we have now with the legal community. You know, in the, in the past, you'd have to go to a courthouse for a hearing. But, um, you know, now you don't have to do that. And so you can take cases really anywhere in, in, in the state. Um, let, let's, but Ken, what, what's your thought on just, you know, the, the suburban market, both r residential and yeah, other? Again, you know, like the, with the have and have not K-shaped, um, you know, some office buildings that uh, have the right parking ratio that are generally modern have bandwidth. Bandwidth is really important. And that goes, you know, to the haves and have nots in society right now. You know, lots of kids going to school are doing just fine because they live in houses with bandwidth and neighborhoods with have bandwidth. And lots of kids don't have access to that bandwidth. And that's a problem, you know, in this country from a societal level. The same thing is with real estate. Some buildings are modernized. They have the right air conditioning. The air conditioning systems can be modernized to be post COVID, you know, ready. That is something that's an ongoing uh, debate right now about how much is necessary I'm having, I'm actually in the, in the thick of that right now on a building that I just took over management, whether we're gonna add UVC lighting to it and other filtration methods. So it really depends on the type of building, where it's located, I think access to, to freeways and access to neighborhood uh, restaurants and, and retail certainly will all help. If it's you know some building that's in the middle of nowhere, it's not gonna do too well, even if it is quote unquote in a suburb. You know, we did a UV lighting uh, two weeks ago on, 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 you know, on this webinar, and it's, it's, it's taking off both in terms of buildings, in terms of hotels. Everyone's into this UV lighting now to try and see if they can, they can destroy the, 
the germ on, on, on contact. I want to go to, to what Amazon's doing because this is kind of interesting. These are, these are the cities that Amazon is expanding into at the top 20 markets. And it's kind of interesting because it isn't just your large cities that you would expect like San Francisco, New York, but you have secondary cities like, like Raleigh and Minneapolis and Phoenix and, and Detroit. And the reasons they're going into those cities is because they have found that there's top tech talent in these, in these cities. And so that's going to become a determination of, of the real estate market because where Amazon goes, you know that the residential market is going to be stable and you certainly know that the office market's not going to be too bad because you'll have other companies serving those areas. What's your thought on that? Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think where Amazon goes, you know, good things follow. But, you know, Amazon is a very highly priced stock. I think Amazon's taken up so much oxygen in the room of, of e-commerce. Um, you know, I'm a little nervous about having all of the, you know, the e-commerce eggs in, in the Amazon basket and how much control that they have. Sooner or later, people are going to wake up and say, wait a minute, these guys are, 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 are pushing a lot of different levers uh, across you know, the, the economy and across, you know, societal boundaries. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. And then also what happens with jobs. There was a, a question about what, what effect AI is going to have on unemployment moving forward. And I don't think we're going to ever have like a Skynet, you know, uh, a Terminator type AI system that's going to destroy us. But I think AI is taking away a lot of jobs in the legal profession you know, AI programs read documents uh, in journalism. It creates, you know, small articles. Um, things are changing as a result. You know, also bringing back manufacturing from China sounds great, but a lot of that manufacturing that's going to come back is going to be done by industrial robots and, and, and 3D printers. So I think we have to be honest about what employment's going to look like and the utilization of space moving forward. And, 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 you know, there are a lot of economic political theories on how to deal with that. And that's not what we're going to talk about today, but, but people are still talking about a universal wage, the 600 bucks a month for a period of a week for, you know, that we had was the first stab at that. And, and, you know, with robots uh, one day, uh, there may have to be some discussion of taxing robots or, or figuring out how to, how to keep people going. Uh, you know, on this picture right here, and I, I want to move on. This is actually Fifth Avenue. I recognize the building. My dad used to work in the building on the right. That was 666 Fifth Avenue. It's actually right across from, from Trump Plaza. And you can see there's almost no one on the street right by that, the Nike building. And it's really a, kind of a, an interesting, uh, unfortunate sight. Uh, let's talk about listings. Uh, I want you to take a look at this if you can, Ken. We're seeing that listings are, are, are not as high for apartments and, and residential rentals as they are for real estate listings. And so the red, excuse me, the blue is the real estate listings. We're seeing listings are now coming back and people are feeling that this is a, a seller's market. And so they're trying to benefit. Before that, it, listings had dropped precipitously. Uh, and so now we're seeing uh, listings coming up. But, but you know, as we see from the title company, the velocity, and, and, and speed by which, uh, you know, people want to sell or refinance that, that you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a very busy time in it for, for many realtors right, right now. And if it's not yet, few, it will be shortly. So just you have to hang in there. One of the questions, what do you think about the small, the strip plaza sector? What, what, what do you think is going to happen to the strip sector? I mean, there is you a know, place. If they're, if they're well located, I saw that question. If they're well located strip, strip malls that are surrounded or, or located near uh, you know, uh, a residential community that'll support the small businesses, you know, the pizza, the pizza place, the nail salon, you know, the barber shop, as long as the, you know, the demographic infrastructure is there to support that, that strip center, it'll be just fine. But there's literally hundreds of millions of square feet of strip centers that were built, you know, in, in the eighties and late seventies for all the wrong reasons, uh, for, for tax, you know, uh, avoidance reasons that are just not located in the right place and don't have the demographic support to make them, you know, to make them do well. So again, it's a, it's a case of haves and have nots. Uh, the retail strip centers here in, in, in West Broward and Sunrise, Plantation, Weston, most of them are, are going to be just fine. They will see probably a 20% a, a hit on their tenants, but that's short term as we move through, you know, this crisis. Ken, we're, we're, we're out of time as usual, and you know, we could keep going for another half hour, and it, but unfortunately, our, our time is up for today. I, I want to thank you as always. Uh, again, I want to thank the, the law firm Oppenheim Law, uh, where we are dealing with all these issues on a regular basis uh, for, for homeowners and, and, and lenders and, 
and, and folks who have businesses and people who are buying new businesses or in disputes with their businesses. There's just so much going on. And on the title company, people who are buying, selling, refinancing, investing. And of course, uh, the law firm is starting to see, unfortunately, more activity in the area of, of foreclosures. Uh, we anticipate that that's going to become a major problem as, as again, 30% of the population right now is already 90 days behind on their rent or mortgages. And so depending on what this next bailout looks like, you know, we, we could see something that it pales compared to what we went through just uh, 10 or 11 years ago. So Ken, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I want to thank everyone again for, for, be, for participating and, and being interactive. Uh, again, on behalf of the law firm and the title company, Roy Oppenheim, Zoom at noon. This was number 24. See you for number 25 next week. Thank you and have a great day and a great week. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Be Ken. well, everybody. Take care.